Okay, we have 4.5 global wind patterns, and then we have an absolutely hilarious comic over here, and it's funny because he says, I'm not a huge fan, but he's a windmill. He is a huge fan. Okay, so air at different elevations. Elevation is height above sea level. So here we have oxygens and nitrogens mixed. Remember the air is mostly nitrogen. The next biggest chunk is oxygen. At sea level, we have a lot more particles. As we move up in elevation, here's 14,000 feet. We still have air, but there are fewer of those molecules. The air density is less because air pressure is less. Those molecules are able to bounce and move around further away from each other. It increases your volume. That's why the density decreases. Uh, less dense warm air rises. As it rises, it cools and becomes more dense again, and that's what keeps the cycle going and going. Water vapor capacity. This is the amount of air that water can, uh, amount of water vapor that air can hold. This is the fancy way of talking about humidity. Warm air can dissolve more water. That's just basic solution chemistry. As to increase solubility of a solute in a solvent, you just increase the temperature of the solvent. In this case, air would be the solvent and water would be the solvent. Solute. So as you increase temperature, you can hold more solute. Increase the temperature of the air, you increase the water vapor capacity. And then here's just an example. At 90 degrees Fahrenheit, we have this many water dots. And at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, we have this many water dots. Lower temperature, fewer dots. Very sciencey, I know. Adiabatic heating and cooling. Now this is kind of a weird concept for kids to wrap their head around, but adiabatic heating and cooling is temperature change based on changes in pressure. You're not moving thermal energy in and out of a system, like when you put something on the stove or put it in the microwave to make it hot, or when you put it in the freezer to make it cold. This is where you're changing temperature, uh, you're changing pressure, and that results in temperature change. If you've ever sprayed air from those little electronic cleaner canisters, it feels cold when it comes out because of this adiabatic cooling. The air in the can is under pretty intense pressure. It's condensed into a very small volume, so when you release it into the regular atmosphere, it expands rapidly and cools down because of this adiabatic cooling. This is what happens as air rises through the atmosphere. It, as it rises up, pressure decreases, so it expands and it cools down. That's pretty much all there is to it. Then we have latent heat release. This is the energy that's uh, released or taken in by uh, water as it changes state of matter. So whether it's releasing energy or taking in energy depends on the direction of its phase change. We'll pause it here for a minute so you can get that wonderful, wonderful knowledge in your head. Okay. Now here's a little diagram showing us how these convection cells in air function. At the Earth's surface, this is where pressure is the highest. So this is where your temperature is the highest. Your air is squeezed to its smallest, uh, smallest volume. But as it heats, it's going to rise. It expands a little bit, so it starts to float. As it floats, air pressure decreases, so a diabatic cooling takes in, and it starts to cool down. Its density starts to increase because its volume is decreasing. As the temperature drops, this air can't hold as much water vapor anymore, so the water falls out of solution as precipitation. That's why the tropics are so rainy. When the air is up in the atmosphere, now it's cool, because of that adiabatic cooling, and it's dry because it lost all of its moisture through precipitation. Well, when it's cold, its density increases, so it sinks, for lack of a better word, back down to the surface of the earth, where pressure is going to increase, so you're going to get adiabatic heating. The air is going to increase in temperature because it's being squeezed. The opposite of adiabatic cooling as it moves down, it's still pretty dry because it came from the sky and where there was no moisture. When it reaches the Earth's surface, it's going to flow from areas of high pressure to low pressure. As it flows across the Earth's surface, which is mostly water, it's going to pick up some moisture. 
and that just kicks the cycle off all over again. And it just goes again and again and again. As long as we have atmosphere, we will have these convection currents. Okay, now here, this was a little difficult to demonstrate using 2D pictures when really this is a three-dimensional process, but solar energy from the sun hits the earth. It's most direct at the equator, so that air warms up and moves away from the surface of the earth. It flows up into the sky. As it rises, it cools down because of that adiabatic cooling, and it's going to flow in the northern hemisphere, north, and in the southern hemisphere, it flows south. Part of this is because of the Coriolis effect. Part of it is that you have this high pressure at the equator and then these lower pressures here at the higher latitudes, 30 degrees and 60 degrees. This is a Hadley cell. It results in these uh, trade winds. It was called the trade winds because it helped Europe get to the New World to do all of their pretty horrible business. And then there were the feral cells between 30 and 60 north, you have the westerlies. They're called the westerlies because they blow from the west to the east, and then that helped sailboats, big ships, get from the New World back to Europe to continue that whole cycle of awful. But uh, at the uh, Hadley cell, where it meets the feral cell up in the atmosphere, that air is now very cold and very dry because as the air in the Hadley cell rises, it drops its water in the form of precipitation. That's why your rainforests are here at the equator. And your deserts are here at the 30 degrees north, because the air that's beating here to uh, flow back down towards the earth is low in moisture. The Hadley cells have very little moisture to contribute because they've already lost it as they rose. Same thing with these feral cells, but they're coming from the north to the south in the northern hemisphere and then invert that for the southern hemisphere but the air here at 30 degrees north and south has almost no moisture in it because the air that's converging there came from high in the atmosphere where there's no moisture and then yeah those are feral cells then you have your polar cells here between 60 and 90 degrees north uh, this you have more moisture than at the 30 degrees north and south, uh, so you don't end up with tons of desert. You can have those boreal forests where you have some moisture, but these are also pretty dry. And it's all based on those convection currents. It's just a little difficult to explain because it's a three-dimensional process in a, a two-dimensional picture. Here also tries, in the northern hemisphere, we have the Coriolis effect, effect that deflects the, uh, wind and water to the right. Uh, when you're moving away from the equator, when you're moving towards the equator, it still moves to the right from your perspective. It just looks like it's pointing to the left because... dumb. Uh, but everything is deflecting to the right. It just depends on your perspective. And then here we have those Hadley and Farrell cells uh, named after the scientists that hypothesized they existed, Hadley and Farrell, and then the polar cells are just because they're at the poles. I highly recommend watching a better video something with graphics and animation, because that's going to give you a much better idea of what's going on in these pictures. This is just a quick review that biomes around the Earth are usually functions of their latitudinal gradient. Here we have our tropical rainforests. They're right here at the equator. 30 degrees north, we have deserts. 30 degrees south, we have deserts. It's functions of these convection cells. Now, Coriolis effect. In the northern hemisphere, it deflects objects to the right. In the southern hemisphere, it deflects them to the left. This apparent deflection is because of the rotational speed of the Earth. The equator is rotating faster than the poles. So if you're at the equator and you throw something towards the poles, the land underneath it is going to be moving slower than the land where you are. So it's going to look like the object is lagging behind. That's why it deflects to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. If you're at the poles and you throw it towards the equator, 
It still deflects to your right, but because the, la the land you are standing on is rotating slower than the equator, it looks like it's moving ahead. It's still moving to the right. It just depends on your perspective. If you are a person standing here looking south, that is your right. If you are a person standing here looking towards the poles, that is still your right. College Board likes to ask questions about the Coriolis effect and then flip it to the southern hemisphere, so you kind of have to mentally invert what you're used to. Uh, again, there are much better videos that explain the Coriolis effect because they have animations. Finally, we have gyres. Gyre, not gyre or gear, gyre. They are these large ocean surface currents. They're caused by the Coriolis effect and wind on Earth's surface. The Coriolis effect affects the wind, which affects the surface current in the oceans. And if we look in the northern hemisphere, they deflect to the right, and in the southern hemisphere, they deflect to the left, uh, just like wind currents. There are five of them, five major ones that you need to know, the North Pacific, South Pacific, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. They're named after the hemisphere they are found in and then the ocean they are found on, except the Indian Ocean gyre because there's no Indian Ocean in the northern hemisphere. Uh, these are because of the Coriolis effect and the wind that on Earth's surface. They are large. They're, they affect temperature, salinity, and nutrient distribution worldwide. They also act as kind of traps for ocean trash. The Great Pacific Garbage Island is here inside the North Pacific Gyre. Uh, pretty rough times.